Uh, thanks, Catherine. Uh, good morning. We are the Passive House Retrofit Group. My name is Barrett, along with my partners in Vika and Madi. Anna will be in our advisor, Ben Lear. We'll be discussing uh, a Passive House Retrofit project in Brooklyn, New York. Um, our project, project is focusing on the building sector and specifically the residential building sector in New York City. This graph on the left is a breakdown of stationary or building carbon emissions in New York City. The residential sector is a major contributor of greenhouse gas emissions, accounting for 16 million tons of CO2 equivalent. CO2 equivalent is a way to convert all greenhouse gases based on their global warming potential into a standard unit. So in 2020, residential buildings accounted for 33% of total emissions in the city. In the next slide, I'll discuss some of the issues in the New York City building sector. Most of the building emissions come from a small number of large buildings emitting the same amount of greenhouse gases as a large number of small buildings. This is a problem. In addition, uh, in New York City, there's an aging building issue with the average date of construction being around 1939. As well as an aging building stock, there's a lot of masonry buildings, which were easy to build, hold structural load well, but are often poorly maintained. And with age and poor maintenance lead to lower performing buildings, which lead to increased energy consumption. This is the reason why we picked a New York residential building for our retrofit project. And Bika will take it from here to talk about current building codes and laws pertaining to these types of buildings. Thank you, Barrett. So New York City has Local Law 97 and Local Law 87 uh, to address uh, Local Law 97 we talked about uh, to address uh, um, 25,000 square feet building for uh, greenhouse gas emission through operational energy and Local Law 87 address about 50,000 square feet uh, buildings that has emission of um, carbon dioxide and they set the goal of 50% uh, by uh, it 50 percent uh, by um, 2030 and 80% by 2050. On the right side, you can see that carbon capping, uh, they are doing the uh, by rounds till round five by 2050. And we, we followed some baseline standards and rules, Title 63 Energy Conservation Code and SD uh, standard for doing retrofit in, in our building. Now, Barrett is going to talk about how we selected our building. Great, thank you, Ambika. We wanted this project to be replicable. Um, so prior to picking our building for retrofit, we performed some initial analysis using NYC open data. We were able to understand some characteristics of New York City buildings. Here are some results in terms of averages in the top left. And after looking at these results, we were able to set up parameters for the building when we would like to retrofit. Using the parameters, Listed in the bottom left, we were able to find 39, over 39,000 buildings that fit the criteria. In the right, you can see a heat map of the locations of the building for which are fit our parameters. 228 Washington in Brooklyn was picked because our capstone supervisor was able to get our baseline architectural drawings. Thanks, Ben. Um, but most importantly, the building was fit our parameters. And the next slide will provide some additional information on the building. Um, 228 Washington Avenue is the building we're going to use as a baseline to apply our retrofit design to. Um, 228 Washington does not fall under any of the local laws, and so it is a perfect candidate for our parameters. It is a smaller, older masonry building where we will be able to reuse some of the building materials in the retrofit process. Um, 228 Washington is in the Clinton Hills Historic District. And this means that the building has some restricted measures regarding remodeling the outer facade. We will go into more detail on this when we discuss our wall assemblies. I'm gonna pass it to my partner, Mariana, to discuss passive house design and how we apply it to our retrofit as a way to improve building performance. Thank you, Barrett. So when we talk about buildings, we know that the whole system consumes a lot of energy to keep it comfortable in a healthy internal environment, mostly from fossil fuel. So here is where we introduce the passive house. It's the most strict method of operational carbon, uh, operational carbon use and energy efficiency. Uh, this is a construction concept, a building certification, but it's also a methodology of how we build buildings. And when you look at this image here, uh, it's about making a really airtight, insulated 
uh, and durable building with no heat exchange. Passive House is based on building science. So these are the five main practices uh, where we have a super well insulated building as a continuous layer wrapping the whole building envelope, high performance windows, a continuous airtight layer inside of the building, a design with thermal, thermal bridge free, uh, which is any kind of penetration within the thermal envelope that allows energy to move in and out of the building. And lastly, the ventilation with heat recovery, uh, where we essentially use the exhaust air to preheat the supply air to get it around uh, room temperature. So in this graph here, uh, it shows how much energy is being reduced when we apply all the passive house standards. And compared to a building uh, a standard building, the total energy used by a passive house is 75% less. It is 90% less heating energy and 80% less cooling energy. And here on the right side, uh, we have an image of a Hearst index, the home energy rating system, which analyzes the energy efficiency of buildings. Uh, we can see different standards in terms of energy performance, like LEED and Energy Star, and the passive house performs much better. Now I'll pass over to Barrett again. Thanks, Mariana. She did a great job introducing passive house as a way to reduce operational energy and in the process, lower operational carbon emissions. As you can see on the left, there's nearly a 50-50 split between operational carbon and embodied carbon emissions of a building. Embodied carbon is the greenhouse gas emitted during the production, harvesting, transportation, and disposal of materials. Passive house addresses the operational carbon emissions during occupancy, however, leaves embodied carbon unaddressed. For this project, we were analyzed different construction assembly materials as a way to lower embodied carbon during the retrofit process while still meeting the passive house standard. This will take the form of four different building strategies where we pick building materials based on assumptions of their embodied carbon. A high, medium, and low were produced for replicability, as well as a historic retrofit strategy based on the location of the building in the Clinton Hill Historic District. Um, we will then perform analysis on the four different building strategies, calculating their actual embodied carbon. In addition, our project will be evaluating material from cradle to site, which is a way to calculate carbon emissions from the production through the delivery to the site. In the next slide, we'll address how to apply our design concepts to, to, to 8 Washington Ave. So introducing a retrofit methodology, we picked three different strategies. We looked at conventional material that's normally used for insulation in general, low body carbon materials, and some experimental materials such as hemp. So the big difference we can see here is the insulation layer, this yellow line. So the baseline is basically a brick building. Uh, the options we consider for our embodied carbon study, they have the, the insulation outside of the building envelope. And as this specific building is in a historic district, we consider an option with the insulation inside of the building, keeping the facade as it is. So another difference is the TFA, the treated floor area, which is the usable area, excluding the areas for internal partitions, doors, and stairs, for example. So for the embodied carbon option, the TFA is slightly smaller because we used uh, internal insulation for the basement. As in the historical situation, the TFA is a little reduced, also considering the internal insulation. And here we can see the air tightness layer in both cases inside of the building as a continuous barrier. Now, Ambika will explain the same concept through the sections. Thank you, Mariana and Barrett, for explaining passive house and embodied carbon. So here we can see difference between a uh, section for baseline and embodied carbon in typical older building and the historical district building. So baseline has only a brick and steel and other concrete material. And um, in typical older building, we applied outside insulation. And for the basement, we applied inside insulation. And we provided inside air tightness layer and outside wind tight layer, WRB, where the resistance barrier. And for the historical, there is like a Title 63 rules for preserving our elements uh, for maintaining historical values. So we applied inside insulation, air tightness, 
and be followed with the inside we provided um, WRB layer. And uh, ne in next slide, we are going to discuss about building assemblies. So here is our three building assemblies. So what we do, this, this, these assemblies are for typical older building, how we are going to retrofit the smaller scale building. So in first one, you can see low embodied carbon building. We apply a passive house principle and uh, considering embodied carbon into material. So you can see here on roof, we applied hempcrete. There it was existing steel structure. So that will help you wear the load. And the ground wall, we also applied hempcrete of 50 inch thickness. And for the roof, we applied 21 inch thickness of hempcrete. And for window, we used uh, wood windows that has low embodied carbon. And for the basement, because they are the chances of moisture intake and air intake from the soil. So we used mineral wool for it. Uh, for the air tightness uh, for this model, uh, we applied lime plaster inside and outside we applied WRB or SB oriented stand board with a taping of jib. Uh, for medium embodied carbon, um, building assembly, we use dense pack cellulose that easily available in the US from recycled material. And we applied outside with OSB and taped with um, WRB barrier tape. And we, inside a wall, we have another layer, we applied OSB with air tightness tape. And we used window Jola that has aluminum and window, sorry, wood. <laughs> Uh, aluminum and wood. And for the basement, we considered mineral wool because we can't use dense pack cellulose in the basement. And for the high embodied carbon building assembly, we considered our older typical material expanded polystyrene that has high embodied carbon and it's commonly used in US. So that's a uh, have a little bit, it decreased the volume for the material, but it has high embodied carbon. So after applying that, we applied OSB with tape outside for WRB, but after the brick, we uh, used Intello plus paper barrier that has plastic, that has high embodied carbon, but it's thinnest. It can reduce the, like, it will not affect our inside volume. But for the basement, we continue to use EPS, uh, expanded polystyrene, um, for the insulation. So uh, now we are going for historical one, how we retrofit historical one. Because there was a constraint of rules. We have to preserve the elements, corners, uh, lintels, and the sill, and everything like a, a wall outside. So what we did in this strategy is, uh, firstly, after the outside layer of brick, we applied the lime plaster for the air barrier. After that, uh, for, I'm talking about the wall first. Uh, after that, we filled up with dense pack cellulose. Then we applied OSB, um, OSB layer, and then we taped with air tightness, membrane, uh, air tightness tape. And for the roof, we consider, because we are considering different materials to retrofit, because there was a, a that will affect our habitable space also. So we had to consider that how we can uh, maximize use space for the people inside the building. So we consider to use dense pack cellular instead of hemp because hemp needs a lot of volume for placing in it. So we are not using attic space. Attic space was not habitable. It has like a lower height. So we used 21 inch hemp um, uh, on the roof. And for the basement, we consider mineral wool again. And for the window, we used a landmark commission approved window that's named Bivosa Victoria and it's, it's made up of wood. Thank you. And now Mariana will talk about uh, passive house method methodology results. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Ambika. In order to get to passive house standards, uh, we get the energy an, an analysis of the building using a tool called passive house planning package. It's our beloved PHPP. So this energy model looks at areas, walls, windows, considering their orientation, all the different materials we used uh, for each analysis, and it generates this table uh, showing the heat and cooling demand of the building and showing if uh, by using all these strategies, we get your passive house or not. So this is the baseline 
results. We have the heating demand, the cooling demand. This is the passive house criteria. As, as we can see, we don't have a passive house here. But here we can see the results for our low embodied carbon option, the heating demand, the cooling demand. Uh, and with these results, we achieve the passive house criteria. So looking at all the results, uh, we can see they are slightly different in terms of energy demand and all of the inactive passive house. And just to remember, we had this number as our baseline. So uh, by applying passive house methodology, the energy demand reduction is huge. And just to make it a little bit more visual, uh, this graphic, uh, we have the same results showing the yearly general energy demand for each study, combining heating and cooling demand. So this yellow curve would be our heating demand, basically showing the months when we would need to heat the building. And the blue line is the cooling demand, is the summer season when we would need to cool down the building. So it doesn't say much until we compare it to our baseline. Here we can see the yellow bars are the baseline. So uh, it's super clear how this energy demand reduction is big. It's, it's quite beautiful, actually. <laughs> now, Barrett. Thanks, Mariana. Now that we've established that all of our building constructions and wall assemblies were able to meet the passive house standard, we need to calculate the carbon for each of our, the embodied carbon for each of our construction types. Uh, to do this, we use the inventory of carbon and energy database. The ICE database was created in 2011 at Bath University in the United Kingdom as a way to track embodied carbon of building materials. The database is composed of nearly 200 different construction materials and their embodied carbon values of kilograms of CO2 equivalent per kilogram of material produced. Using this database, we we're able to calculate based on volumetric measurements of our building material, how much embodied carbon is in construction. Couple this with transportation carbon calculator, Um, from Carbon Care, which is based on a European standard for energy consumption and carbon emissions from transportation. This standard uses weight, transportation vehicle type, and distance to calculate emissions. The number we'll be using for this project is tank to wheels, which includes the carbon emissions of the vehicle itself. Here are a couple examples of 100 kilograms transported. The first one is from Europe and the transportation emissions uh, count to 53.9 kilograms and compared to the transportation emissions from Maine to New York, which is roughly 50, or 14 and a half kilograms of CO2 emitted for the thousand kilograms. In the next slide, we'll see a combination of uh, the tra transportation of the three construction assemblies. Here's a matrix of our three different assembly types based on their carbon emissions from transportation. The transportation emissions from the low embodied carbon was significantly higher because we were importing um, hemp from Austria and the hemp blocks are extremely heavily so there's a large weight to import. Um, the high embodied carbon construction assembly transportation carbon emissions were the lowest because the material used was able to be locally sourced. For example, the insulation came from Buffalo, New York and the windows came from Colorado. So we're, we're now able to, uh, here's visualizations of the embodied carbon comparison of our three different wall assemblies. In the low wall assembly, we can see that there's a negative value. This is actually accounting for carbon sequestration. Carbon sequestration is the capturing and storing of atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, the, the medium carbon has the materials that sequester carbon as well. Um, the high embodied carbon does not. For this project, it is the amount of carbon stored during the growth of natural materials such as hemp and wood. And so the building itself will act as a carbon sink. Um, and the next slide is a combination of the historic as well as high, medium, and low construction types. For the historic, we were able to reuse some of the construction assemblies, such as the windows and roof, but we're forced to have alternative assemblies because of the historic district 
regulation. So now that we have established carbon, embodied carbon can count as a negative because it, the materials sequester carbon, we can add the operational carbon to the embodied carbon numbers uh, over the course of the building's lifetime. So for each of the graphs, starts at year zero, which is a sum of the embodied carbon emissions of the building. To this number, you add yearly operational carbon emissions. So from year one to year 100 of occupancy in five-year increments, you can, this graph shows how many years it takes for the operational carbon to equal and then surpass the embodied carbon of the building. So for the low embodied carbon, it takes nearly 90 years of operation carbon to surpass, to meet, then surpass the amount of sequestered carbon stored in the building. On the final side are the same four construction strategies alongside the baseline construction. The baseline is a minimally insulated building and produces significantly more carbon during operations. Um, to conclude, we proved that we can meet passive house standard and well as improve passive house design by considering embodied carbon of materials during construction. Um, and that concludes our presentation. And thank you for listening. <laughs>